We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in to one of ACC's messages. As you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're on social media, use the hashtag you belong at ACC if God taught you anything during this message. We want to get to know you. So check out our online community by watching our live service at arundelcc.org live. This is where you can interact with other viewers in the chat, fill out a prayer request, and follow along with message notes. And we believe that God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church. Great to see you all. Uh, as Pastor Michael said, we're in the second week of our Colossians series. So grab a copy of God's Word, open it up to the book of Colossians. If you don't own a copy of God's Word, we're going to fix that right now. Just reach underneath that chair in front of you, grab that Bible, write your name in it, and take that home with you, all right? So you have, everyone in this room has a Bible. Let's turn together to Colossians. A quick overview. Last week, we, we introed the book. And a couple quick things that we learned, right? It was written by a guy named Paul who was radically transformed by God. And he was writing a letter to a church of believers in a town called Colossae. And the book of Colossians is simply that letter that we get to read. What was Paul communicating to this group of believers? And remember that letter in chapter 4, it says to take this letter and pass it on to other churches so they can read it also. And so here we are, we're going to read that letter together over this series, and today we're going to read through Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8. I hope that you can uh, grab the content from these verses, understand what Paul's trying to communicate. In fact, let's look at the very first verse together uh, of, the, of this uh, Colossians 3, uh, chapter 1, verse 3, and here's what it says. Uh, Paul says, we always pray for you. When he says we, he's talking about Timothy and him, right? He's, he opens up the letter saying, this letter is from Paul and Timothy. So he says, we, Paul and Timothy, we always pray for you and we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what's interesting about this very first sentence after he introduces himself as the author of the letter, where is Paul when he's writing this letter to the church in Colossae? Right? He's, if you don't know this, he's in, he's in prison. He's sitting in jail because of his faith. And he, I don't know about you, but my pride, if I were writing a letter to people and I was sitting in jail, I might like to make the letter about me a little bit. So I'd be like, hey, here's a letter from Matt. I'm sitting here in prison because I was sharing the gospel with y'all. You know, like I'd, I'd make, I'd find a way to make it about me because that's just, you know, my sin nature and you're, don't look at me like that. You do the same thing, right? <laughs> and so, so Paul one of the things we see is that he's, he's got this heart for other people. He doesn't make it about himself. He simply says in encouraging words, I want you to know, regardless of my circumstances, I am so thankful for you. I love it. And so as soon as he encourages them with these words of thankfulness, he gets into what we're, you know, these next verses four through eight. And what we're going to see in these verses today is that there's something about the gospel that is deeper than sometimes we think. Oftentimes, if I were to ask you about the process of evangelism, which is simply the process of sharing your faith with other people, right? Sharing the good news. Most of us think about uh, sharing the gospel as a one-step or two-step process, right? Well, first step, you open your mouth and you share the good news with people. And then second step, hopefully they accept it. And you're like, aha, you clean your hands, you're like, oh, thank God, hallelujah, and you move on to the next person. But Paul is trying to simply say the gospel is, is, is an endurance sport. I want you to think about this from the perspective of the Olympics. How many of you have tuned in and watched a few of the Olympic events these last couple weeks? I know today is closing ceremonies. It's all, all done. Uh, USA, more gold or more, more medals than any other country. Is that awesome? Yay, go USA. But how many of you enjoy watching like swimming events? Any swimming event people? How about track, like the running? Um, well, you'll notice that in both swimming and, and track type events, there's two very different style events. There's your sprinting events where you're going a short distance and the runner or the swimmer, right, the moment they get in the water, the moment they start running, they're going to go as fast as they can, give it everything they got because they're sprinting to the end. But then you have more of your endurance events, right, where you, that, that, 
the buzzer goes off and you realize I got to go back and forth across this pool 40 times so I can't give it everything I got. I got I to gotta save some steam. I got to understand there's a process here. Well, here's my point. The, the process of evangelism that, that Paul's going to show us here in these verses in Colossians, it's not a sprint. You don't just go up to your buddy and be like, hey, Jesus loves you. All right, peace out. See you later. I did my thing, right? And it's awesome to tell people that Jesus loves them. But there's some other parts to the cycle. There's other parts to the follow-up. There's other parts to the, 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 what comes next. And so Paul's going to explore that with us in this letter. And we get to, to see that together. It's kind of like uh, teaching a man to fish versus giving him a fish. You know, cooking him up a fish dinner. We have the opportunity to teach others the gospel, not just to share the gospel, but to, to show it, to teach it, and to make it an endurance repeating cycle. So let's look at this cycle together. I got four things that we're going to see in these passages, uh, what I call the cycle of the gospel. And as far as verses go, I'm going to go a little out of order between verses four through eight. You're gonna, I'm going to skip around a little bit, but let's, let's start with the first cycle of the gospel. It's this, hearing. The first part of the gospel is someone's got to hear it. Someone's got to hear the name of Jesus. They've got to understand that Jesus is is part of this cycle. And so we got to use our mouths and they got to hear it. It says in Colossians 1, the second part of verse 5, it says about the people in Colossae, you have had this expectation. We were just talking about a little bit earlier in verse 5, this confident hope. You've had this expectation ever since you first, what? Heard. heard. Ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. This, this process in the church's life, the church in Colossae, the believers there, it all started with the very first stage of this cycle, which was hearing the truth of the good news. That's where it starts. And I love, by the way, that Paul says, The truth of the good news with a capital G and a capital N on good news. I mean, there's something, we all have experienced good news before, right? You you probably heard someone, maybe you've said some of these things before. You you get a friend together, you say, hey, good news. I'm getting married. Good news. We're having a baby. Good news. I won the lottery. Good news, we bought a house. Good news, I hit a personal record. Good news, I lost 20 pounds. Good news. And we like to share good news, and all that news is great. That all sounds great to me. Those are things I rejoice with you, I celebrate. That's awesome that that thing happened. But there's something unique about the good news that Paul's talking about. The capital G, capital N good news. This is good news that doesn't run out. Listen, you, you buy a house, that's pretty awesome. It's an exciting moment, but the, the fun of that, the excitement kind of wears off when that first mortgage payment is due, right? And so eventually, you know, that had a baby, you got to take it home now and change the diapers. You know, you got to like, you know, there's, there's something about the good news that comes through Jesus that's, that's unique. And Paul is saying, listen, you first heard about this good news, and that's, that's that cycle beginning, this, press, this part called hearing. It says in Romans chapter 10, which is another letter that Paul wrote, verse 17, it says, so faith comes from hearing. That is hearing the good news about Christ. We can't get away from this stage, this part of the, the cycle of the gospel, You've got to start with somebody hearing the good news. Have you guys heard of this guy named St. Francis of Assisi? Historical uh, Catholic saint, uh, St. Francis. I've never, uh, I don't know the guy personally, so I I can't. But St. Francis has a quote that is often uh, given, uh, ascribed to his name. A lot of people say that St. Francis has said, and you probably heard this before, preach the gospel at all times you, some of you already know where I'm going, right? And if necessary, use words. Have you heard that before? Preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Now, let me start with this for just a second. Do you think it's important for us to live lives in such a way that even when we're not speaking, people can see Christ in us? Absolutely, that's important, right? We should live out 
the, the, the transforming power of God in our lives. We should live it out in the way we interact with people. Uh, I'm totally fine with preaching the gospel at all times in the way we live our lives. And again, I don't know if St. Francis of Assisi actually said this statement or not, but the second part of the statement I don't like at all. In fact, I think if St. Francis of Assisi said the second half of the sentence and meant it, I would tell you that St. Francis was a sissy. <laughs> and here's what I mean by that. Sometimes we use that, that quote as a cop-out for not opening our mouth and sharing the name of Jesus with other people. You can certainly preach the gospel with your life, but at some point... It's not if necessary. No, it is always necessary to open up your mouth and tell people with your mouth the good news of Jesus. This is an important part and cycle of the gospel because the first part of the cycle, right, is hearing. Someone's got to hear Jesus. It says in Romans 1.16, this is Paul speaking, he says, for I am not ashamed of the good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. And what Paul is simply saying is he's not afraid to open his mouth and share the gospel verbally with others. And I hope that we're a church that's not ashamed of the gospel. You got to ask yourself, when was the last time that somebody heard the good news of the gospel because your mouth was sharing it. When was the last time you shared the gospel? You said, hey, good news. Not good news, I had a baby. Not good news, I bought a house, but good news. Hey, good news, friend. God loves you so much, he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for you. When was the last time you used your mouth to share it? And some of you are like, hey, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. You gotta ask yourself, when was the last time you shared it? And maybe you'll find that there's a little bit more timidity there than you realize. Paul simply saying, he's not ashamed of the gospel. And we read so much of the New Testament as Paul out there opening his mouth and making sure to share the gospel so that other people hear it. Because that's where the gospel starts. It starts with hearing. And by the way, this um, cycle of the gospel we're talking about today, this uh, it's brought, uh, the sponsor of salvation, if you will, is brought to you by Jesus, right? Jesus is the one who makes this whole cycle possible. He, there is no good news without Jesus. Paul knows that. I, I, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping you understand that without me getting into that uh, Jesus is the reason there is good news. And so we got to open our mouth and share the good news of Jesus with others. We, we want them to hear it. So hearing, all right, number two is believing, Believing is, is the next part of this cycle. We, we say it so that other people can hear it, and then whether or not, once, once they hear it, they get to decide what they're going to do with what they've heard. It says in Colossians 1, verses 4 and 5, this is Paul, again, he says, For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all of God's people, which come from your confident hope of what God has reserved in heaven for you. And then he finishes again with that last part of verse five. You have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. Simply what he's saying is, guess what? You heard it, and then what I'm really excited about is you heard it, and then you believed it. Ever since you first heard it, you've had this confident hope. You've believed it. You trusted in this gospel. You see, what's interesting about this telling of the story is that it sounds like the church in Colossae, when they heard the gospel, they believed it immediately, at least almost immediately. It doesn't seem like there was this big process. It says, from when you first heard it, you accepted it. I don't know about you, but I often don't have that kind of luck when I share the gospel with others. How great would it be if every time you told someone that Jesus loved them, they're like, wow, I didn't know that. Let's do this. And that'd be cool, right? I mean, I'd but oftentimes we live in a, a different world and a different place and a different time. And oftentimes you share your faith with someone and, and they hear it and they choose, for whatever reason, not to receive it, not to believe it. And you share your faith with them again. And sometimes some of you are in your, I've been sharing my faith with the same person for 40 years and they still don't believe. The cycle is stuck. 
at them hearing it, that they're not believing it. Let me encourage you with this thought. You, friend, are not responsible for others' decisions at this point. You're certainly responsible to share your faith, but whether or not they choose to believe it and receive it and accept it, that's not your responsibility. You don't got to be burdened by what they do with the faith that you just shared. It's their responsibility to take this cycle and, and choose to believe it. Right, it says in John 3.16, you guys all probably know this verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. What does it say there? That anyone who what? Believes. This is an important step in the process. They've heard the gospel and now they have to decide whether or not they're going to believe it. Because the, the saving grace of God, this, this process of sanctification, of receiving the Holy Spirit and being in right standing before God, it's only available through Jesus and it's only available through belief in Jesus. And so this is the next step. Someone has to believe it. Now let me clarify for just a moment. There's a big difference between knowing and believing in. I would even say be between believing and believing in. It says in Scripture that even Satan and his demons know that God is real. They know that Jesus died on the cross. They were there taunting him the whole time it was happening. They are well aware of the saving work of Jesus on the cross. There's got to be a difference between this knowledge of what Jesus has done and receiving it and accepting it and believing it. The way I like to explain this is there's a, a passage in the book of Revelation that shows us the beautiful invitation that God gives to every single one of us. It says that he, Jesus is standing at the door of our heart and he knocks. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. He doesn't kick his way into your life. He doesn't enter in like a SWAT team. You know, you can't, uh, he doesn't force anybody to believe in him. You all have the option to do that if you want. He's standing at the door knocking. Now think about it this way. There's, here's what knowing about Jesus, knowing uh, would be like if someone comes to your door and knocks at the door, right? Your ears process that there's someone knocking at the door. And so you go to the window probably because no one knocks on our doors anymore, right? You're like, unless they're selling us something. And so you peek out the window, and you look out, and you see that someone's standing out there. You now know that there's a person at your door, and you get to decide what you're going to do about it. You have a knowledge that there is a person on the other side of your door. And so for some of us, what we do is we hide, and we turn off all the lights, and we are, shh, shh. we pretend like we're not home, and that's a knowledge that we haven't received. The alternative, right, would be this kind of belief understanding of Jesus is standing at the door knocking. It'd be like, again, hearing someone at your door knocking, going to the window and seeing, yes, there's someone there. And then you go to the door and you open it and you invite them into your home. You see, that's the difference between knowing and believing. And so the second part of this cycle, once somebody has heard the gospel, they have an opportunity to, uh, the, the do someone's knocking at the door they have the opportunity to open the door and invite Jesus in. Now you might think, well, what kind of, you know, what, what do I got to know about the person on the other side of the door before I feel comfortable letting them in? Do I got to be like a theology expert before I enter into belief? Do I need to have all the, the seminary training? Do I need to have been in a church for seven years before I'm like, all right, I finally get what all this means. I kind of understand how the Bible works. So now I'm ready to believe. Is that, is that what the process looks like, or is it just simply opening the door? Let me, let me, you know, the Bible says in Matthew, I think it's in 17, Matthew 17, that in order to enter into belief, all you really need to have is the faith the size of what? Mustard seed. mustard seed. Let's look at what a mustard seed looks like real fast. It's not that big. If you drop this seed on the kitchen floor, it's gone, right? You're not going to find it. You're, it's, it oh, bummer, right? It's, it's not like a sunflower seed or something bigger. It's a tiny little thing you see right between those two fingers, and yet when you put it in the ground, it kind of looks like a tree, doesn't it? But it's technically a shrub, uh, but it can grow up to 20 feet tall, and this is uh, kind of the mustard plant. Huge, 20 feet tall, all from that little seed. 
And what scripture is simply saying is it doesn't take a ton of faith to go into this stage of belief. Here, here's how I like to, to understand this. There's an illustration of a professor who is teaching physics to his class. And so he, he has an illustration where he takes a, uh, like a, a toy, a little plastic toy, and he ties a string to it, and he, he tapes the string to the top of a whiteboard. And he says, listen, I'm going to show you this. I'm going to teach you some things about this pendulum and how gravity and friction and some laws of physics work. So he grabs the toy and he grabs it to one side. He slides it up the whiteboard and he marks with the black marker. He says, what I'm going to do, I'm going to drop it. It's going to slide uh, across the whiteboard to the other side. And when it stops, uh, the highest point, I'm going to mark it. And we're going to keep doing this until it's, it's at rest. And so he does it. He, he marks it and he shows that every single time it goes a little bit lower and a little bit lower until it finally comes to rest at the bottom. And he says, now he's explaining, you know, physics and friction and gravity and how all these rules of physics all make this thing happen. He said, so how many of you believe that this same thing would happen every time? And everyone in their hand, everyone in the class raises their hand. They all understand and believe in this law of gravity and this law of friction, these the physics things. And all right, all right. So he said, all right, well, since you believe, and he picks one of the guys in the class, this big football, burly football player, and says, I want you to come up here. And it was a room about this size, a ceiling about this tall. And what the teacher had done is he had uh, pinned up a long rope and at, at the bottom of it, a big bowling ball. And he said to the guy, all right, I want you to come stand right here. He already worked out the math where you pull the bowling ball and it, it was right at the guy's nose. He said, all right, now all you got to do, we, we already saw what's going to happen, right? If you stand right here, you're going to be fine because you already told me you believe that this ball, it's going to swing all the way to the other side. And when it comes back, it's not going to hit you because that's the laws of physics and gravity and all that stuff that we just talked about, right? He's like, yeah, 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 I'm fine, I'm fine. So he gets up there and they put this ball right on the tip of the guy's nose. Big old bowling ball, heavy ball. And the professor drops it and everyone watches in slow motion as it swings all the way to the other side. And it comes all the way back. And right when it gets like feet from this guy's face, he, he jumps back. I don't know about you, but we probably all have a reaction like that. Like, I, I believe it. I know that if I stay right where I was and I don't lean forward and I'll be fine. But there's this, this crisis of faith. Like, do I really believe it? And here's what I think it takes to be a follower of Jesus, to step into this level of belief. It doesn't take, a, just, just like in this instance, right? It doesn't take understanding all the laws of physics and gravity and the laws of thermodynamics and all the, it doesn't, it doesn't require any of that. It just requires a simple faith that when this ball swings back, it's not going to hit me. If you have that amount of faith, you'll be able to stand right where you are with confidence. It might be a little scary, but you'll be able to do it. Simply put, the amount of faith it takes to step into belief in Jesus, you don't have to understand all the deep uh, wells of theology. You don't have to understand uh, Greek and Hebrew. You don't have to be the, uh, you know, seminary trained, all that stuff. It just takes a simple understanding. I believe that God sent his son Jesus to this earth to die on the cross in my place. And boy, would I learn, love to learn more about what that means and how to, to follow him now. But I, I, I have enough faith. I, I don't understand why this thing's not going to hit me in the face, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand here with the faith the size of a mustard seed. But it's important to understand that that's still the second phase of the cycle is belief. Here's the third, the third phase is transforming. Now here's the problem. For a lot of us, we think of the gospel and we think, yep, yeah, we got to share it. Others hear it and then, they, and then hopefully they believe it. And then we kind of walk away as if that's the process of evangelism. But evangelism is more than just sharing. It's more than just hearing. It's more than just believing. There's more to it, according to Paul. And he says that transforming is another part of the, this process that these church, uh, the church of Colossae went through. In Colossians 1, verse 7 and 8, it says, You heard about the good news from Epaphras. So they, there was a part of the cycle where they heard it, right? Our beloved co-worker, he is 
Christ's faithful servant, and he is helping us on your behalf. Then it says this, and he told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. Epaphras has reported back that there's some sort of transformation that's happened in the people's hearts, that the Holy Spirit has caused them to now love people differently than they loved people before. And Paul's excited about this transformation that he's seeing in their hearts and in their lives. Let me ask you a question. What is the one thing that all of us in this room that are brothers and sisters in Christ, what is the one thing we all have in common? I want you to think about this. There's a there's something that's, that's really, in fact, I use this word in common on purpose. Let me tell you why I use the word in common. Because in scripture, the words in common, we, we get a Greek word called koinonia. And koinonia is often translated in scripture in the word fellowship. So when it says all the people, they, they fellowshiped together that a lot of times what we do as Christians, we think fellowship is just a word to describe a bunch of Christians getting together and having a potluck downstairs. Fellowship is not Christians having a potluck together. Fellowship means uh, coming together and having something in common. There's something that we have in common. I'll give you a hint, right? It's this thing that when you give your life to Jesus, you've decided you want to be a follower of him, and you, you start this relationship with God, we all receive this gift, and we all have it. What is this thing we all have in common? The Holy Spirit is in each of us. The same Holy Spirit that's in me is in you. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is inside each of us, brothers and sisters in Christ. We have the Holy Spirit in common. And Scripture here says that this Holy Spirit, when the people of the church of Colossae, they gave their life to Jesus through belief, they received the Holy Spirit, and it transformed them. It changed the way they loved people. Instead of loving people the way they used to love people, they now love people differently. In fact, if you really think about what is the way we used to love people before Christ? I would say our focus, what does the world say? Who should you look out for? The world says you should look out for number one. Who's number one according to the world? Ourselves. We became, just in our sin nature, the moment we're born, we're really good at loving ourselves. And then scripture says in, in Matthew 22, verse 39, when Jesus is talking about the, the second greatest commandment, he says this, the second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. What I love about this concept of loving other people the way I love myself is before Christ, we all became experts on what it looks like to love ourselves. And in a way, that can kind of be a good thing in that you now know better how to love other people now that you've given your life to Jesus. You can now love other people the way you used to love yourself. And so the Holy Spirit is transforming the hearts of the people in Colossae. They now no longer love themselves the most. They've, their hearts are changed and they now love people in a new and unique and special way. Another word for transforming, a churchy word, is a word we use called discipleship. Right? Part of this endurance sport called evangelism is walking people through this process of discipleship, helping people become more like Christ. You know, when we are infants, newborns, we rely on other people to feed us, right? If you were just left on your own, you wouldn't be able to eat and you would starve and die, right? So you require other people to put food in your mouth. But what, what happens at some point, a parent is going to start teaching their child how to, how to use a spoon, or how to use their fingers to grab food and put it in their mouth. And they're eventually going to use a spoon. And before they know it, they're using a knife and they're eating steak, right? Uh, the process of discipleship is like that. We have to learn how to feed ourselves. You can't just require the church to do all the feeding for you. You've got to learn how to uh, become more like Christ and to feed yourself. And so we have this discipleship program that we're launching this fall. I'm so excited about it. We launched a discipleship program last year as kind of like a beta, and now we're like rolling out the, the real deal. I want you to know there's four parts to it. I'm going to go over this real quick because I'm so excited about it. One of them is, is simply 
uh, the, this Discipleship 101. It's a 13-week course for people who are brand new to faith. They just gave their life to Jesus. they recently been baptized. They're not quite sure what they believe. They have faith the size of a mustard seed, but they're excited. They're like, I'm willing to stand in front of the ball, but I don't understand any of this stuff. Discipleship 101 is a 13-week course that helps them understand the essential beliefs of following Christ. It's a cool, cool thing. We've been doing that already, but we've improved it, and we're ready to launch, relaunch it in the fall. Uh, we also have another part of our discipleship program, which are our growth courses. We've had growth courses before, but we now have a three-year scope and sequence of different growth courses you can take. We're talking like a practical things like how to handle your money or how to have a healthy marriage, but also like biblical growth courses, like how to understand how the Old Testament fits together and what is this book of Isaiah all about. All sorts of growth courses you can take. A third part of this discipleship program are these things called the Go Deeper Weekends. And it's a weekend retreat where you don't go anywhere, you still sleep in your house, but you come here all weekend and you are with other people and you learn how to study God's word in a deeper way. We're going to offer that two times per year going forward where you can learn like, listen, I read God's word, I don't really know what to get out of it, I don't understand what I'm reading. Come to a Go Deeper Weekend, we'll teach you how to study the word of God. And the fourth thing is probably the thing I'm most excited about. We're going to be offering an apologetics certificate for people who really want to go deep in their discipleship, really want to understand brand new things about their faith they've never seen before, want to, want to be able to share their faith in a really practical way and answer questions that other people have. It's a three-part thing that if you do it all in a row, it takes about a year. If you want to do it out of order and take three years to do it, you can do that. But at the end of it, you'll get an apologetic certificate that's all part of our discipleship program. And all four of those things, why do we do that as a church? Because God has not called us in the Great Commission. He hasn't called us to be a church that goes out and makes new converts. He didn't say go out into all the world and tell people the good news of Jesus. And as soon as they believe, run away from them and go tell someone else. That's not what he said. He said go out into all the world and make what? Disciples which is an endurance sport. It takes time. It takes work. It's not easy work. The Bible doesn't say go out and make new converts. It doesn't say go out and make Bible trivia masters. It doesn't say go out and make people who like to raise their hands and worship. It says go out and make disciples. And so as a church, we take that seriously. We want to be a place where people are able to be discipled, and we want to teach you in this process of evangelism, these cycles of the gospel, how to disciple other people. Because transforming is an important part of this process. And by the way, it might, I might be making it sound really easy. The Bible says in Luke 9, it says, Jesus said to the crowd, if any of you plans to be my follower, you must give up your way and take up your cross daily and follow me. It is not easy to be a disciple of Jesus. And so the work that we have in front of us is hard work. It's an endurance sport. All right. All right, here's the fourth part of this cycle of, a, of the gospel is repeating. Repeating. Can you guys picture a moment where you've walked up to like a pond on a really clear, calm day? There's no one out in the water. There's no ducks in the, in the pond. It's just the, the water is like glass. Have you, can you... You picture a moment where water's been like glass, and you can go up to it and see your reflection in it. What do you do in a moment like that? If you're weird like me, what you do is you turn around and you find the biggest rock you can, right? Like, we're going to mess this up, right? And you go find a rock, and you, you throw it out as far as you can into the middle of the pond, and you just watch as all the water's disrupted. And right there where the water, the, the rock hits the water, right, it's just this process of you, you watch it grow out from that moment. Everything stays nice and clear until those ripples get to it and then everything starts bouncing off everything and you've just messed up this serenity. But it's, here's the thing, the gospel is like that. You, the gospel is not meant to, to be shared and then just stop. It's meant to be making disciples who make disciples. It's meant to repeat. And here's what it says in Colossians 1 verse 6, the one verse we haven't read yet. It says, this same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. 
It is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives, just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. You see there in verse 6, it says that the, first you heard it, and then it changed your life. So there's the belief and the transformation. And now he's saying, and by the way, that good news is going out all over the world. The gospel is spreading. It's being repeated. Think about this for a moment. Just a real quick word picture. If each of you in this church, if each of us went out this week and we shared our faith with one person who received it, who believed, if each of us, and I know it's not that easy, let's imagine that it is. If each of us went and shared our faith with one person who accepted it and received Jesus into their life, this church would double in size next Sunday. That's the kind of repetition that's available. And we might think, well, that, that, that could never happen. That's just not the way it works when we share our faith. It's, it's this long process, and I've been working on the same people for many, many years. Well, think about this for a moment. Here's what Jesus says in John 4, verse 35. He says this, You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. Let's pause right there. I do not know that saying. Any of you ever use that saying? So back when Jesus said this, this must have been a popular saying that people said all the time, and I've never heard it, but we get to understand what it means because this is what Jesus says next. But I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. What Jesus says is that in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your home, in your uh, grocery store, the fields are ripe. There are people ready to hear the gospel and receive it and start this process, this cycle of evangelism. They're ready to believe. They're ready to be transformed. They're ready to be discipled to a place where they would be able to share their faith with other people. The fields are ripe. And for some reason, we're like, ah, oh, we've got to wait four months until the, the harvest is ready. Jesus is saying the harvest is ready right now. I wrote down this, this sentence. Let me try to make it make sense. I wrote down the good news is far too valuable to just share. We ought to share it, yes. But we ought to share it as often as we can with as many people who want to hear it, certainly. And for those who believe, we ought to then continue to share the good news with them in, in the process of discipleship and watch them be transformed into Christ-likeness. And for those who are transformed, right, we want to encourage and model what it looks like to repeat the process and share our faith with others and teach them how to share their faith with others. The gospel is far too valuable to just share and then stop. So what do we do with this? As we're here at our, our What Now God moment, I want to encourage you as a church to consider what, what step you might need to take that God might be prompting you to do right now. The Holy Spirit inside of you, what is the Holy Spirit telling you to do with this information? It's kind of a weird transition for just a moment. Bear with me. Have any of you ever seen a ballerina's feet? That's some ballerinas right here. You've seen what I'm talking about. When you put a a woman who's been in ballet point shoes for let's say 15 years of her life if she was willing to show you what her feet look like when she's not wearing those point shoes you're going to see some gnarly bunions and calluses and toes that are twisted where they're not supposed to be and that's i mean they're going to be really ugly feet some of you in here right now you got some really ugly feet and you're not a ballerina you got no excuse. You got some ugly feet. Well, I got some good news for you. Do you know that Jesus is a podiatrist? He actually tells us in Scripture how we can go from ugly feet to beautiful feet. Here's what he says. You get to see this whole cycle repeated in, in Romans chapter 10. It says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe? There's that 
that first cycle, you know, they, they got to, or the second part of that, they got to believe. And how can they believe unless they have heard? There's the first stage of the cycle. How can they believe if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? There's that repeating cycle. And how can anyone go and tell them without being sent? You see this discipleship process that, that repeats itself. It says, this is why the scriptures say, you ready for this? How beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. So when I wrote this message on Tuesday, I had one thing to put up on the screen. I'm gonna put it up on the screen right now. Here's my call to you as a church. You ready? Have beautiful feet. To be a church that opens our mouth and shares the good news of the gospel so that other people can hear it, so they have an opportunity to believe it, to open up the door and invite Jesus in, and then walk that person through the process of transformation through discipleship and teach them and model for them what it looks like to repeat the gospel, to constantly be sharing the good news of Jesus with other people. Be a person with beautiful feet. Now, last night, God asked me to do something a little different. And so I'm going to be obedient to that. And I've, I've told our staff I'm going to do something a little different at the end of this message today. And here's what I want to do. If you're in this room right now and you've been called into vocational ministry, in other words, God is putting a calling on your life that you're supposed to serve him full time as a career. Maybe it's in a church. Maybe it's in a ministry organization. Maybe it's as a missionary. I don't know what it looks like, but if you feel like God has called you into ministry, is putting a calling on your life to serve in a ministry, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand wherever you are. And maybe some of you in the room, you're already serving in ministry full time. That's already your calling. I'm going to have you stand too, because you're, you're running that calling. And, and here's the unique one. If you're not sure Maybe some of you are like, I'm not quite ready to make that commitment, but I feel like God certainly put that idea on my heart before. It's something I'm praying through. It's something I'm considering. I want you to stand up too. And so those are your three options. If God's called you, by the way, before you stand up, he's called every single one of us into gospel ministry. Nobody in here gets an out because you don't get paid for it. All of us are called to share the gospel. But specifically, if God's calling you to serve him vocationally in a, in a full or part-time capacity as part of your, your career, you're not sure about it or you're already doing it, would you stand up right where you are right now? I want to have a chance to pray with you and pray over you. That's awesome. Now, what I want to do is, for those of you who are around someone who's standing, if you would mind scooching over and putting a hand on their shoulder. We're going to pray over them and uh, make sure that everyone's got someone. We're just going to pray for, for wisdom for those who need it. Pray for courage and boldness for those who have already accepted that calling, that they'd be moving into it, and for endurance for those who are already living it. All right, let's pray together. God, we thank you right now for those who are standing that are, aren't quite sure about their calling. They're not sure if you're calling them into ministry, but you've put a, a hint in their, in their mind. You, your, your spirit is tugging them maybe in that direction. They're, they're really seeking wisdom and clarity right now. Father, I pray that you would bring them that clarity, that your Holy Spirit would give them a very clear direction, that they would understand what it looks like uh, if you're calling them into ministry, that they would see that clearly. God, for those who are in this room right now who have received that call, they, they've they haven't stepped into that role yet, but you, you have already given them a very clear direction that they're meant to serve you vocationally with their lives. Would you give them all the courage that they need, give them the, the faith over fear that they need, that they'd have the ability to put down any hurdles, any burdens that are weighing them down, that they'd be able to run full-fledged into that calling that you've given them, that you give them the courage to do it and to throw off any burdens or things trying to hold them back. We know that the enemy does not want them to step into that calling. So would you set up a, a hedge of protection around them as they pursue your goodness and your good plan for their lives? And for those that are in this room that are already serving you vocationally in ministry, would you give them the endurance and the strength they need to continue to run the race 
that's before them. Would you allow us to be a church that encourages them and supports them and prays for them? God, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have as a church to be a church that releases people into this world to do ministry. And God, for these people that are standing right now, those who might be being released into ministry, we release them in the name, the powerful, mighty name of Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. We are so thankful for the truth that was shared in the message today. Please know that we as a church are praying that what you have learned today and the truths that God has put deep into your heart will manifest and grow into something amazing. You can experience that with other believers at ACC on Sunday mornings at 710 Aqua Heart Road. And remember, you belong at ACC. Thank you.